So, with this information, we will go for the morphology of bacteria. Morphology of bacteria. That brings us to the concept of dividing and classifying bacteriology. So, look at this. Classification of bacteria is to be done away with. Why? Because if you enter into any kind of jungle, like huge amount of information, the first step you have to do is organize it. Once you organize the reading of the information, the analysis of the information and giving out an output from the read analysis can actually become easier. So organization is a must. Whenever you enter into a jungle of bacteria, you have to follow the same. For example, in pharmacology, when you wrote second year exams for pharmacology, you will have an essay question that will start by saying, classify this group of drugs or classify that group of drugs. Example, classify beta blockers. Example, classify beta lactam antibiotics. Example, classify antibiotics. Classify antihypertensive drugs. That for it will carry some amount of marks like for example, 4 out of 10 can be given for it. And when you write the classification well, just like how you had in mathematics, they will not be able to reduce even one mark in the classification sector. They will give you full marks for the classification. And why classification has such a powerful value? Because you may not know in and out of every single drug in your second year MBBS about pharmacology. But if somebody comes and tells you the drug is a pindolol, the drug is a bitoxolol, the drug is a sotolol, you should be able to identify which group of drugs that they belong to. First, you are supposed to say they are beta blockers. For that to be understood, you have to understand that the drug belongs to ANS chapter. In the ANS chapter, they come under the adrenergics rather than that of cholinergics. Among adrenergics, you have to say it is not in the alpha adrenergic area, it is in the beta adrenergic area. In the beta adrenergic area, you should be able to say whether it is an agonist or antagonist. So here you have understood that in case of beta-lol or bitoxolol, in case of pindolol, they are cardio-selective, while timolol is actually oculoselective. Next, you understand pindolol is a special drug, though it is a cardiovascular beta blocker, it has intrinsic sympathomimetic activity as against a general consensus that this pindolol is a beta blocker. So, the prototype drug for beta blockers can be propranolol. If you want to understand about a beta blocker, you just have to read through the five to six pages dense information about propranolol. But when you go to the chapters of pindolol, bitoxolol, timolol, etc., you will have them in a very small paragraph content. The reason is that the prototype drug will carry all the basic information needed about that group of drug and if at all you want to understand a different drug who is similar to that, there are only two things you have to learn. One is, how is the new drug in the same line as the previous drug called as prototype drug? How is the new drug different from that of the prototype drug? If you could actually answer all those things, then your understanding of the drug becomes easier. So, for example, if I say pindolol, it's a non-selective beta blocker and it is cardio-selective against that of propranolol. In case of propranolol, it can act on beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, etc. Doesn't care. But pindolol has specific action on the cardiac system called as beta 1. Along with that, it will be able to have sympathomimetic action. That makes it unique. So, every single smaller drug after you learn about the major drug is that you try to compare how the smaller drug is similar to the major drug and how the smaller drug is different and better than the previous drug that you have. Likewise, in case of microbiology also, when you try to understand about a particular organism, you have to understand which group it comes under. So, you try to understand the whole concept of the group as such. Then you go deeper to understand about the individual organisms and see how that organism behaves like that of the previous group of the organism and how is it different from the group as such. Example, you have a group of organisms called as pneumococci, but previously they were called as streptococci pneumoniae. If they were in the family of streptococci, there was a reason. Now they are not a part of the family, again there is a reason. So, what were the similarities that kept pneumococci in the streptococcal family and what were the dissimilarities who were discovered that made streptococcus pneumoniae lose a knock of the pneumonia in such a way that it goes for pneumococcus as a different family. That is the place where you understand the similarities and dissimilarities. So, remember classifying 
an organism is a must for you to move forward. On that basis, look at the different ways by which you can classify an organism in terms of morphology. Some bacteria can be aerobic, anaerobic, they can be intracellular, extracellular, flagellated, non-flagellated, gram positive, gram negative, etc. Right? So we start with the first concept here. In terms of morphology, we look for gram reaction and we look for shape and structure. Generally, if I ask you, if an organism is not gram positive, then what is it? Your first answer would be, it is gram negative. Please remember that it's a small mistake because just because an organism is not gram positive, it does not mean it has to be gram negative because there are certain organisms who are not gram stainable at all. So, you can have gram positive organisms, gram negative organisms and gram non stainable organisms. The best example would be Tryponema pallidum. But, for many practical purposes, if you perform gram stain on the organism called as Tryponema pallidum, though it is not accepting any of the gram stains, by merely exposing it to the red colored dye, it may appear pink at the end of it, which can make it believe as if it's a gram negative organism. So for many authors, this Tryponema pallidum comes under gram negative group of organisms. The next is about the shape or structure. If an organism is like a rod, you call it as bacilli. If it is comma shaped or spherical, you call them as cocci. In case of a combination called as both, some can exhibit both like activities. A cocco bacilli, example, Haemophilus, sometimes Yersinia. These organisms, all of them, divide by binary fission. What do you mean by binary fission? If you take one organism and break it, you will get two. Now, you take each one of the two and then break it, you will get two each. That becomes four. So, binary fission would mean to say that it is capable of doubling. And this is one of the primitive methods of multiplying. Now, look at this. I start with a single caucus. If I go for a plane of division, that is, there is one division. Now, this division can make sure that this particular structure can give rise to, this half can give rise to one sphere. This half can give rise to another sphere. So, one becomes two. Now, look at this here. This is a plane of division, you can look at divisions happening. Here you have two divisions, but it is still one plane of division. I say a person is living at this particular plane. And if I draw something else like this, both of them are in the same plane as such, but at different altitudes. But if I draw it this way, this is called as a different plane. I draw it this way, it will be a different plane. If I draw exactly like this, this is the perpendicular plane for this particular plane. So we have two divisions but one single plane. That would give me that you will have three bacteria coming out of it and each of them can grow out to become a particular cocci. So, we can have multiple cocci coming out of these divisions. Now, go for a higher level of dividing. You have the same plane of divisions but you have multiple divisions and every time you divide it, a particular sector can give rise to a cocci like this and all the cocci will be happening to be in chains. These are called as cocci in chains, which is the best example, streptococci. Now, look at this. If I go for a single division and there is only one plane of division and I stop abruptly at that, then what am I left with? I am just left with two cocci together. So, when one plane of division and one division happens, fission stops, then I will be having a two cocci together. This is called as pairs of cocci, also referred to as diplococci. Now, what are the best examples of diplococci? Among gram positive diplococci, you have pneumococci, which I just said it is Streptococcus pneumoniae. In case of gram negative, I have Nicereal group of organisms, example gonococci or gonorrhea and meningitidis. These two organisms are gram negative diplococci. Okay, now we will go one step forward. You take up the basic organism who is a sphere called as a cocci. And you don't allow just one division, you go for multiple divisions and each of the division is in a different plane. And you have multiple planes. When you cut it out in multiple planes, each sector will develop into a cocci like this. You will have multiple sectors developing into a cocci like this and cocci are surrounding the central area. Now, this will be seen as cocci in clusters. Multiple divisions on many planes can produce cocci in clusters. They look like bunch of cocci. This is the property of staphylococci. And if you go for staphylococcus aureus in specific, you will have the cocci who will come down like this. This is called as bunch of grape appearance and that bunch of grape appearance is also referred to as botryal arrangement, B-O-T-R-Y-U-M. Now, 
you have Staphylococcus aureus causing a condition called as bacterial actinomycetoma. Wait, you will know that actinomycetoma is caused by other bacteria like Actinomyces and Nocaria. Trust me, actinomycetoma can be caused even by Staphylococcus aureus. When I use the word eumycetoma, it is caused purely by a fungi. When I say actinomycetoma, it is caused by anything other than a fungi, but most commonly a bacteria. Staphylococcus aureus is one of the examples of an organism causing bacterial actinomycetoma. So here, when Staphylococcus aureus causes bacterial actinomycetoma, you don't just stop by saying actinomycetoma, you go one step ahead, use the concept of botrium and call it as botryomycosis. So this is to tell you the shape of an organism and the way by which it divides can make a lot of difference in the way you look at the organism and the way the organism behaves in front of you okay so you have a clear understanding that you have multiple types of cocci happening in front of you here you can look at the same thing right now if i draw a bacilli like this this bacilli should look absolutely perfect perfect bacilli or perfect rods are unique for one simple genus of organism called as bacillus. If I ask you what group of organisms is Clostridia? Clostridia are also bacilli. Bacillus, that is also bacilli. E. coli, that is also bacilli. Salmonella, that is also bacilli. But only one genus called as bacillus is getting the name of bacillus itself for being a rod. Why? Because the world's most perfect rods ever belong to bacillus. And among bacillus, you have organisms like bacillus anthracis, bacillus cereus, bacillus thuringiensis. There is another dermophilic organism called as geobacillus dermophilus which is used as an indicator in sterilization procedures all these organisms can have near perfect rods now think about it if i draw a rod which is slightly curved which is slightly curved like this then that can be mycobacterium tuberculosis slightly curved rod can be given by an example called as mycobacterium tuberculosis. If you think about a properly curved rod like this, it can be Vibrio cholerae. Who can look like Vibrio cholerae and behave like Vibrio cholerae? Copycat of Vibrio cholerae is Campylobacter jejuni. And if I go for a little bit of extra bit of folding, then it looks like an S-shaped structure. Now, I go for a level of folding like this. These are called as helical structures. Now, this can bring a huge amount of discrimination between these organisms. In case of Vibrio cholerae, you have a long flagella, which is a single flagella. But in case of helical structure here, that is, in case of a helical structure here, sometimes the flagella can be a group of flagella. Now, I told you, Vibrio cholerae can be mimicked by Campylobacter jejuni. If it is Campylobacter jejuni, you will have a single flagella. But if at all you go towards the organism like the one who has a helical structure with a tuft of flagella, then this can explain about Helicobacter pylori. What is the beauty here? Previously, Helicobacter pylori was named as Campylobacter pylori. It was previously Campylobacter pylori. Why is it now called as Helicobacter pylori? Point number one, Helicobacter pylori is not slightly curved. It is helically twisted. Point number two, it has tuft of flagella at one end. It can produce urease. It can attack stomach and duodenum. And all these properties are different from that of what you learn about Campylobacter jejuni. 
this is slightly curved and not helical it has a mono flagella not a tuft of flagellae it is known to attack small intestine to cause diarrhea and not ulcers it can cause diarrhea dysentery it can even cause gillian barre syndrome none of these can be caused by helicobacter pylori and most of all it not be urea is negative in most of the situations so you find out that this organism who was called as helicobacter pylori was many times known as campylobacter pylori but after more and more studies were done scientists realized it is high time that you have to detach this particular organism from the group of campylobacters so it got its own name called as helicobacter pylori and they are looking helical in nature now this can have a mild variation called as spiral structure variation of the helical structure can be extra helical called as spiral structure and the spiral structure organisms have another name called as examples like spirillum minus and strepto bacillus monidiformis okay you go one step forward if that particular spiral structure is not stopping here it keeps on going like this and they are tightly bound then these are not called as spiral anymore these are called as spirochetal that would mean to say the spirochete organisms like tryponema can be seen borrelia can be seen leptospira can be seen so remember three major organisms under spirochetes are tryponema borrelia and leptospira gene here the flagella will not be coming outside the flagella will be within the wall of the organism inside have you seen a snake running with its foot you couldn't have done it because snake doesn't have a foot at all and the snake will be slithering past using the vibration present on the rib area and that vibration will make sure the organism called as snake will move faster in the local sand area here you will have the flagella creating such a kind of flutter the cylinder will be here if you look at it the whole spiral area from the bottom of it the whole organism looks like a spiral area and you will be having the flagella in this way the flagella keeps on fluttering like this because of which the organism can show corkscrew motility in it so this will tell us these are the other various forms of the organisms that is you have a perfect rod slightly curved rod properly curved rod and more extra curved rod called as helical structure and you also have a variant of helical structure called as spiral structure and extraordinary spiral structure called as spirochetal structure and i have given you examples of each of them so make sure you remember these names for your betterment in answering a lot of mcqs okay 